so just to conclude what I was what I was uh, discussing in the in the, the previous lecture. Uh, so as we reach the late 1960s and the early 1970s, there is a notable uh, loss of enthusiasm for the promise that uh, the Latin American alternative to development ha had originally promised. So if we look at the year 1950s, the year 1950s, there's a lot of, again, enthusiasm, a lot of optimism about the, the possibilities inherent in, the, in this approach, whereas as time moves on in all of, uh, several of these things that we have discussed over the past uh, hour and a half, uh, take place this uh, this op this initial optimism and and and, uh, and uh, enthusiasm gradually starts to fade. The reasons, of course, are many. Uh, as I said, the idea of stagnation and the idea that the the the, the, the so strongly desired autonomous uh, uh, developmental process uh, was actually uh, still. So far away. So the idea that even even despite all the transformations, all the successful industrialization that had uh, uh, taken place, we were still pretty much uh, locked in a system, uh, an international economic system that put very strict limits on the capacity for autonomous growth and development in Latin America and underdeveloped nations in general. Uh, there is a growing concern, especially during the 1970s, and this in Brazil is a very very hot political topic uh, with the problem of income distribution. So this growing awareness that growth does not automatically and necessarily lead to the elimination of poverty and to the uh, the, the increased well-being of the poor classes. Uh, so there is this very, this very, um, uh, uh, very always remembered, very, very discussed, very cited, often cited uh, uh, quote from a Brazilian politician, actually the, the Brazilian minister of, of finance during the early 1970s, when questioned about the problem of income distribution, he said, well, first we have to grow the cake before we share it. And so this logic, the logic of waiting for the, the, the cake to, to grow enough so that you can have your piece of it is something that starts to, of course, grow politically very thin. Uh, and, and of course, this turns into a, a very big concern, not only in Latin America, but in the world uh, in general. So for instance, we have this very famous case when Robert McNamara uh, took over as director of the World Bank in the early 70s. He introduced a new new orientation to the World Bank's policies, which was the, 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 the fight against poverty. Uh, which is, of course, a direct consequence of this realization that growth itself is not enough. You know, there are problems that growth will not solve. And so you have to tackle these problems more, more specifically. So this, of course, is part of the part of the, the this new picture picture that's emerging. Uh, there are, of course, various political and social setbacks in Latin America. We're going to talk about some of them in a minute in the in the in the third lecture. So I won't go into too much details. I have already mentioned them at the beginning of today's lecture as well. Uh, so again, the rise of authoritarian regimes, military coups in Latin America and the southern cone in particular uh, calls into question, you know, this this uh, this uh, unholy alliance between uh, uh, foreign policy uh, and uh, developmental agendas. So. Again, all of this, all of the, all of these mechanisms, all of these connections start to uh, to 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 well, come into into more close scrutiny uh, as as time uh, goes on. But in particular, and here we come back to the beginning of today's first lecture when we when I was talking about the problems that development economics at the center faced uh, uh, towards the the late 1960s, and we look at the Latin American alternative to development uh, economics, and we see that the same patterns come up again. Uh, so those same foes that had been portrayed as the enemies to be to be fought against, or as the the the, the radical extremes that should be avoided, neoclassical economics on one hand and Marxist theory on the other hand, they come back with a vengeance. And so when we get to to the to the the early 1970s, for instance, and the the limits of imports uh, substituting industrialization start to, to become clear. Uh, we have a resurgence of neoclassical, typical neoclassical arguments. They'll say, "Well, this is all in, in, uh, at bottom a problem of misallocation of resources. You know, it's a matter of putting 
uh, resources and putting capital and labor where capital and labor should not have been put. You know, it's, it's these misconceived strategies of development that have produced completely distorted economic structures and that are now uh, starting to show. So we have on one side that type of criticism that's coming back very strongly. And on the other side, we have the criticism that I mentioned in response to, to one of the questions that, that, that were posed at the end of the other lecture, which is the, the more radical left-leaning uh, uh, reaction that, that will say basically, well, uh, we think we can beat the system, but the system is so much stronger than all of us. So there's no way of beating the system if you want to remain within the system. The only way to beat the system is to overthrow the system. And so the entire tradition of dependency analysis that was so, so strong and so influential in Latin America, but also uh, across the world for a short period of time during the late 60s and especially during the 1970s, uh, is precisely a, a reaction of that source, you know, a, a, a more sociological, a more, a more uh, uh, deep-rooted questioning of the, the profound structures that uh, organized uh, the international economic system. And of course, we have Andre Gruner Frank and Emmanuel Wallerstein that's, that are going to emerge as, 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 as critics, as critical voices that are, that are more or less going to um, uh, to uh, pursue that 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 line of uh, of analysis, uh, that does not mean, of course, that develop that that Latin American structuralism, the Latin American version of uh, of uh, development economics, uh, was was gone for good. Uh, it remained. It still remains. It's still a force. Uh, and uh, Sergio, for instance, in his question, asked about the difference between uh, what I think about the difference between old uh, structuralism and new structuralism. Again, I don't have anything too too elaborate or too scholarly to say about that. But just to not not to leave him completely empty-handed, uh, I think. Well, this again, uh, coming from a very distant observer. I think one important difference between new developmentalism, so-called new developmentalism and the original developmentalism or, or, or structuralism uh, is that um, new, new structuralism plays uh, more closely aligned to the rules of mainstream economics. So there is, there is this desire to somehow speak a common language with mainstream economics. So there's a desire to put arguments in more formal uh, manner, for instance, of presenting the arguments uh, according to some, some sort of modeling strategy. So I think that, that's an important difference. Again, of course, several of the original characteristics remain. The emphasis on balance of payments, constrained growth uh, is still very important in new structuralism, new developmentalism. Uh, again, it's coming from the, from the, the the tradition of the two gap models that I discussed during the lecture. So that's still a very important uh, uh, insight within this tradition. Uh, other things lost importance, the emphasis on industrialization per se as a strategy, of course, is much less important today than it was 50 or 60 or 70 years ago. So there are points in common and, and, and points uh, uh, of divergence. But I think perhaps if I had to, to make an assessment, I would say that perhaps the greatest difference is precisely this, this tendency or this desire to speak the language of mainstream economics and all the choices that that implies, of course, because if you want to adopt a more explicit modeling strategy, some things are going to fit, some, some types of arguments are going to fit, and other types of arguments are not going to fit. So I think that's, that's an important uh, difference between these um, uh, two traditions. So, but that was uh, more or less the conclusion to, to the second lecture. And now I am going to upload the um, third set of slides. Let's see. Can you see it well? Yes? Okay. And for this uh, third and final lecture, uh, what I want to do is to look uh, a little bit more, more closely into uh, some of the practical consequences of developmental discourse and of the developmental mission as it took place, as it manifested itself uh, in Latin America by focusing on two uh, cases that I think are uh, illustrative or symbolic in some way, and that are useful to, to sort of call attention to certain, uh, certain nuances, certain subtleties that when we look from these things uh, from too afar, we probably would not be able to see, which are the cases on one hand of Chile and of Brazil. So, Okay, 
So uh, again, we talked about this in yesterday's lecture, development economics was born as a problem solving subject, as a problem solving endeavor, as, a, as, a, as, a, as I uh, uh, put it yesterday. And because it was born as a problem solving uh, endeavor, it has always been concerned with practice, with field work, with actually setting up these uh, assistant missions and sending them to the third world, to the underdeveloped world, to sort of get a, a first-hand feeling of the problems affecting these areas uh, and so trying to come up with effective strategies, effective solutions to deal with these problems. Uh, so in a way we can obviously trace back this, uh, this, uh, this logic of, of, uh, of field work that was so uh, uh, strongly characteristic of development economics in its early stages and it still is uh, to this day. Uh, to a, a very deep-seated and, 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 and uh, going back to an earlier age, missionary spirit that, of course, is very, very, very prominent in, in Western Europe, but, but it's also very, very prominent in the United States. And there's a lot of literature about, uh, about that, uh, that connects or somehow the religious trends with this sort of political and diplomatic word, uh, work, sorry. Uh, of course, we have the, the whole story of the money doctors, the early 20th century money doctors that were already sent in these missionary uh, uh, work to remote places, trying to, you know, educate the natives about their own, their own needs, their own, uh, their own desires, and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, what's different, I think, about the missionary spirit that was, uh, that was typical of development economics uh, in, its, in its early stages in the 50s and 60s, uh, is that it was concerned uh, to a great extent with the transfer of knowledge, not necessarily with the transfer of values, even though these things are, are, are somehow difficult to, to, to separate, but also not so much with the transfer of, uh, of resources, of material resources. Uh, you take, for instance, the logic of uh, Harry Truman's Point Four program, uh, about which we talked yesterday, and, and, and of course, you can see on the, on the picture here on the uh, on the slide, uh, that it has to do with, the, with transferring the fruits and the benefits of the scientific advances that have been uh, achieved by the, the developed world. So it's about knowledge, it's about making knowledge available, it's about technical assistance, it's about somehow bringing this stock of accumulated knowledge that, that's available now in the developed world and making this uh, available uh, putting this uh, within the reach of, of peoples uh, in uh, less uh, developed uh, areas of the world. Uh, of course, this logic is a logic that is not without its, uh, its difficulties uh, in practice. And again, there's, there's quite a bit of literature on this. Albert Hirschman famously coined uh, this, uh, this, this notion of the visiting economist syndrome, uh, by which we refer to the tendency that uh, economists from developed nations, when they went to the third world on these missionary uh, works, uh, they behaved as if they ha they held the magical solution to all the problems, and they just blamed the people, the local people, if they wouldn't uh, actually listen to their recommendations and put them into practice. You know, so there's this this inherent arrogance that comes from the conviction that you have. Uh, a very important piece of knowledge that is not available to everyone else. And, and, and it's just really a matter of people wanting to sit down and listen to what you have to say. And if they do that, they will be able to succeed. They will be able to overcome their problems. And of course, reality is much more complicated than that. And so there, there, there's a whole story of the frustrations that involve these missions, you know, and the difficulties that uh, the visiting economists and the experts that were sent uh, to the third world, they encountered because they simply could not navigate local society, local politics, you know, they just couldn't manage to get their message across. Uh, and that, of course, led to some very dismal, very disappointing uh, results. And so uh, over time, uh, there is this growing sense that uh, it's not enough to just uh, make available uh, the knowledge itself. You know, it's important to find ways to channel all the rest of the, of the, of the requisites for making that knowledge effective in, prax in practice. So you need people who are able to make decisions and to stand by their decisions. You need to be able to, to channel and to gather political will 
to uh, make in popular reforms, for instance. And you have to make to, to have people who are uh, able, who are capable of actually implementing these reforms once they are decided and, and, and backed by, 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 political, by political force. Uh, so all of these things, you know, they're not automatic. They don't, they don't just rise up uh, as soon as the knowledge is available. So we need to pay attention to that as well. So we need to be able to construct these networks that will make the knowledge effective once the knowledge is there and is available. But one of the, one of the things, one of the strategies, one of the, the main strategies, if not the main strategy that was adopted by, uh, by uh, developmental agencies from the US uh, to try to create precisely these networks that would effectuate uh, uh, the the absorption of knowledge more 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 directly uh, was to produce experts from the local population instead of sending the experts with the with the with the mission and expecting that these foreign experts would be able to navigate the local scene why not get people extract people from the local scene people who already know the networks who already know the the you know the 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 intricacies of the local situation and train these people with the necessary knowledge and then send these people back and these people with the knowledge with the correct knowledge with the adequate knowledge they will then be able to much more effectively navigate the local scene and put the knowledge into into effect so uh, I have jokingly uh, uh, described this in the slide as another kind of import substitution. So instead of, uh, uh, of substituting uh, different kinds of industrial products, we're substituting the experts themselves. You know? So instead of importing experts to give us advice, we are starting to produce our own experts to give advice to ourselves. But of course, these experts will still be trained according to the protocols and according to the standards that were, that were uh, uh, implemented and put into place by the original experts themselves. Uh, so this is a very important dimension, I think, of what the developmental economics meant in practice in Latin America and elsewhere in the world as well. Uh, of course, here we see uh, the uh, convergence of different uh, trends, again, different historical trends. For instance, the emphasis on human capital as an important factor uh, behind the process of development is uh, initially, we'll talk about this in a minute, by the work of, of Theodore Schultz, uh, is something that, that is starting, starting to, to gain ground precisely during the 1950s. You know, that's when Schultz is developing his, his original ideas about human capital. But again, this, contrary to what human capital is going to mean in the future through Gary Becker and others within that tradition, which is a much more uh, microeconomics, rational choice way of looking at uh, human capital formation, for Schultz, human capital was basically a part of the bigger problem of economic planning, of economic uh, 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 decision making from a macroeconomic perspective. So the whole tradition of, of what was referred then as manpower planning, you know, you know, nowadays we probably would say educational planning, of actually trying to devise or trying to establish what are the needs in terms of skills, of technical skills uh, uh, in the, the labor force, in the, the people who are going to be hired into the labor force, and then training these people preventively in accordance, in accordance to those needs is something that is gaining a lot of ground in the 1950s as part, you could say, of, a, of an enlarged input, out, uh, input output matrix uh, uh, a la Leontief. So you just, you put the educational training as part of the inputs that are necessary to actually make industrialization and economic development function in practice. So that's something that's, 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 that's gaining a lot of ground at, at that time. And because of that, we start to see the proliferation of all these uh, academic cooperation agreements, you know, these uh, academic institutions from the US mostly, but also from, from Canada, from Western Europe uh, uh, in, in some occasions uh, that are being recruited to do the training precisely. Now, of course, when we talk about academic cooperation agreements, sometimes they're geared to more low level training, to basic entry level training. Sometimes they're geared to elite training, to training the leaders of the process of development and of the process of modernization in particular, precisely to train those people who will be in charge of making the decisions and of carrying through the important decisions within the process of development. Uh, so again, this is very widespread at the time. I'll talk about two experiences in particular, Chile and Brazil. 
uh, where we can see this logic uh, uh, in practice. But again, it's important to realize from the start that this is all inserted into a larger, a larger uh, framework, uh, which again is modernization theory. So one of the, the important uh, premises of modernization theory, I don't think I've, I've mentioned this yesterday, but it's, it's, it's uh, pertinent to mention this now, uh, is that uh, the process of transformation of a society from traditional standards to modern standards, uh, it will be, it, it will only be effectively carried through if you have a modernizing elite. So you have a group of individuals who are sufficiently well placed socially and politically and economically, of course, uh, to actually make that modern vision carry some weight. So that's, that's a way of, of, of introducing a modernizing avant-garde, we could say, within that society and counting that that avant-garde will be able to uh, put the necessary pressure within the different spaces of the, of the, of the system, of the, of the social and the, the economic system, uh, to make the changes that are necessary to break gradually with the bonds of tradition and, and, and so gradually uh, introduce uh, the new standards of, of modernity. So when we look at these training programs, you know, at these agreements that were signed and all these Latin American scholars that were sent to the United States to get their PhDs in economics, in sociology, in, in political science, in the natural sciences, all of this, in a sense, is part of that same process, you know, of training the elite that will be able to successively modernize these societies, you know, so you train them, you send them back, and you hope uh, that they will be able to uh, use that human capital, that intellectual capital that they have acquired to good effect in, 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 at the service of the cause of modernization. So one very, very, very famous example, perhaps the most famous of all the examples of this kind of agreement is, of course, the agreement that was signed by the, the University of Chicago and the, the, the Catholic University of Chile uh, in, in the 1950s, and that would ultimately give rise to the Chicago Boys as, they, as the, the group of, uh, of, of economic advisors to the, to the Pinochet regime in the, in, in the 1970s came to be known. So, of course, that is a very a very uh, widely discussed episode for several reasons with the recent emergence of uh, these uh, neoliberalism studies as a super hot topic in the in the United States of course this has once again become a very important subject so everybody's talking again about the Chicago boys and about what it meant about the, how the Chicago boys were the 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 first uh, uh, laboratory experiment in the implementation of neoliberalism so there's all that you know it's something that has come up in a big way in recent uh, scholarship and also in recent public discussion. Uh, so I want to I want to recover this episode and explain to you some of the the nuances and the intricacies behind this this uh, 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 this episode, basically to show you how the ultimate result, the end result, actually depended on a very 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 restrictive and difficult set of circumstances. Uh, so in this sense, to think that the, the, the Chicago Boys example, the Chicago Boys experience, this is my interpretation at least, uh, is typical or is, 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 is something that could be easily replicated elsewhere uh, is, in my opinion, very misleading. I think that that experience is a very, very unique experience that could only really have, have uh, uh, taken place the way it did within that context, you know, of Chile in the 1960s and the 1970s. So let's go back a little bit to the origins of this uh, of this uh, agreement and try to understand what was the logic behind it. Uh, so the agreement between the two universities, between Chicago and the Catholic University, was sponsored by ICA, which is the International Cooperation Administration, which is one of the agencies that was created precisely to implement Truman's Point Four program. So it was a technical assistant agency that was that was charged with organizing and sponsoring these missions to uh, underdeveloped uh, uh, countries, underdeveloped nations, uh, that would somehow uh, uh, broker these transfers of knowledge between the US and uh, the, 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 the beneficiary nations, so to speak. 
Uh, but of course, this was no longer the ICA of Truman. This was the ICA of Eisenhower. And of course, the foreign policy of the United States with the ascension of Eisenhower to the pres presidency uh, took a very, uh, a, a, a very markedly conservative turn when compared to what came before and what came after. So you have this very strong, very clear conservative uh, interlude in foreign policy in the United States during the, the 1950s, especially the late 1950s associated with uh, the Eisenhower presidency presidency. So again, this is an ICA venture that is pretty much marked by this conservative look towards Latin America that was typical of the time. So the agreement was negotiated throughout the year of 1955 and was finally signed in 1956. And uh, uh, please pay attention uh, from the get-go uh, uh, that the distance separating the beginnings of this project and what, what we associate uh, with its end product is very large. It's almost 20 years because the Chicago boys would only come to power in 1973. So we're talking about a very long-term affair here. So it's important to keep that in mind. A lot of things happened between those two moments, between the moment when the agreement was first signed and the moment when the Chicago boys became advisors to Pinochet in the early 1970s. Uh, but again, it's, I think it's very, very fair and very uh, uncontroversial to say that uh, the logic behind this particular agreement, as it was designed by ICA, uh, involved the, the desire to create a space, an academic space, an institutional space, that would function somehow as an antidote to what was perceived at the time as excessive left-leaning uh, uh, tendencies in Chilean economics, especially the, the economics of the CLA, of the, of the structuralists that we discussed in the, in the previous lecture, but also the economics as it was practiced in the University of Chile, that was, that was pretty much a mix of uh, ECLA structuralism with Keynesianism. So that's more or less the, the, the theoretical ideological mix that you found at the University of, of Chile at the time. Uh, and so this agreement was meant as a sort of a, balance, a balancing act. So let's introduce a different kind of economics that will serve to uh, present a more favorable picture of free market capitalism. This is something that is very explicitly said in, in some of the documents uh, that surround the agreement. This is something that's very well documented in the book by Juan Gabriel Valdez, for, in, for instance, which is the, the classic work on the, on, on the subject. So again, this is, this is the explicit motivation. You know, these people in economics, they're two lefties. And so we need to introduce a different kind of economics that will serve as a, as a counterbalance to these left-leaning tendencies that we find already very deep-seated uh, in Chilean uh, society. So that's more or less the, the spirit of the agreement. There's an important contextual element as well, which is the, the famous Klein sex mission that was uh, hired actually by, by the Chilean government in the mid 50s uh, to deal precisely with the problem of persistent Chilean inflation at the time. Uh, so again, this uh, uh, connects very clearly to the origins of the monetarist versus structuralist debates on inflation that we talked about in the previous lecture. So the Klein sex mission is, 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 is in a, in one of the early spaces where that confrontation came to, to the fore very explicitly, you know, because of course the, the, the recommendations of the mission, which was basically a group of, uh, of uh, international financists, uh, was very orthodox, monetarist, IMF oriented, demand control, so recessive adjustment and, and, and all that. And that was very poorly received in, in the Chilean political uh, community and in Chilean society in general. So uh, the recommendations of the mission were not really implemented in practice. Uh, and uh, there was this, uh, there's this, this sense that the mission actually failed because it could not convince the local actors uh, that its, uh, its recipes for stabilization were, uh, were, uh, were adequate or were, 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 were uh, useful in the case of, uh, of Chile. Uh, so again, this reinforces this perception that well, in, insofar as economics is concerned, uh, Chile is leaning too far towards the left. And so we need to balance things a little bit. We need to introduce a different kind of economic outlook, a different kind of economic approach that will make Chileans see that there's also merit, there's also value in, in, in market enterprise and in, in liberalism, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what's important also is to think about the, the status of the two uh, main institutions uh, concerned in this agreement. 
Uh, the Catholic University of Chile uh, at the time was a very, very small uh, institution that had a very modest reputation, especially in economics. So it was not at all an important institutional player or an important academic player in the Chilean scene at the time. And as a matter of fact, the, the original plan of the ICA uh, mission was to have the University of Chile itself as the host of the program. So the idea was that, was that the, the agreement would be signed between the University of Chile and Chicago University to create within the University of Chile itself a group of more market-friendly economists, so to speak, to put it a little, in a little simplifying manner. Uh, but the University of Chile refused the agreement. They were not interested because they felt that they did, did not have control enough uh, over the terms of the agreement, so they preferred to not, not be involved with it. Uh, but for the Catholic University, on the other hand, this was really a golden opportunity because, again, as I said, they were a very small, a very modest university, and they saw this agreement as a chance of actually coming up on the Chilean scene and positioning themselves as an institution, an academic institution that should be uh, uh, should be heard, that should be taken into consideration uh, more uh, more strongly. So that that's also an important part of the of the nature of the agreement as it was signed. Oh, I forgot to tell you the 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 the, the figure in the in the in the slide is Theodore Schultz. I talked about Schultz in the previous slide, so I forgot to mention, but this is Theodore Schultz, the future Nobel laureate in economics. He won the prize in the early 70s together with Arthur Lewis, of whom we, we talked about yesterday as well. And Schultz was the head of the economics department of Chicago uh, at the time during the 1950s. He was that of the economics department of Chicago for a very, for a, for a, a very long time. Uh, he was a specialist first and foremost in agricultural economics. And because of that, he had a lot of experience doing field work in Latin America as an agricultural economist. So he had participated in several missions during the, the late 40s and early 50s to Latin America. Uh, but as I said, at that time, he was beginning to develop also his ideas on human capital and the importance of human capital as a factor uh, explaining economic growth and development. Uh, so Schultz is a very important uh, character in this story because it was through his brokerage, in fact, that Chicago landed the agreement. Uh, and why do I say that, that that's important? Because Chicago, contrary to the image that we have nowadays of Chicago, Chicago was not really perceived during the 1950s as one of the most prominent institutions for economics. Chicago, of course, was a very traditional university already, and especially very traditional in the social sciences. It had been a very prominent uh, 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 space for economics during the interwar years. But during the late 40s and the early 50s, the Department of Economics at Chicago was going through a very difficult transition. Several of the most important household names, Jacob Viner, for instance, had left and had departed for other universities. And the university was actually having a, a sort of a hard time replacing those names with uh, suitable candidates, with candidates that could uh, restore the department to a prominent position. And so Schultz was the person who was in charge of leading that transition. He had come from the University of Iowa in the late 40s as a specialist in agricultural economics. Uh, and, and, and very quickly, he ascended to the position of head of the department. And so he was the one who was in charge of, of sort of uh, hiring out and finding people that could bring Chicago back to its, uh, to its old standing. Uh, but again, this is important uh, because uh, the, one of the main motivations for Chicago was that through this agreement, they could have access to research funds and to a channel of, of uh, an institutional channel into the, the post-war uh, scientific establishment that they would not have otherwise. So again, Chicago is in a fragile position and they see this agreement when it is presented, when Schultz brings the, the proposition to the university uh, as, as a sort of, what, as a possible lifeline, as something that would, that would help reposition the university in more favorable terms within the, 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 changing, uh, um, the changing framework of, uh, of academic economics in the US at the time. Uh, Schultz was able to broker the agreement because in one of his missions to Chile, he had made acquaintance with the guy who was responsible at ICA, who was an ICA technician who was working in Chile, uh, and who was responsible for, 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 for uh, implementing the agreement. So he was the guy who had come up with the idea. Uh, that was one of the first uh, initiatives of its kind. And so he was the guy who was in charge of finding the adequate institutional arrangement to make that, that, 
that uh, project viable. Uh, and so he became acquainted with Schultz. He knew Schultz's work as an agricultural economist before, and he made acquaintance with Schultz on the field in, in Chile, and they developed a very strong uh, bond uh, that actually sealed the deal. So it was through this connection between Albion Patterson, uh, the ICA technician uh, working in Chile, and Theodore Schultz, who was doing some missionary work of his own at the time, that this connection between these two, of course, given uh, the, 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 the relative weights, uh, these two uh, second tier universities in their respective intellectual environments, their respective academic environments at the time uh, became, uh, became reality. Uh, how do we come from this to uh, the ascension of the Chicago boys uh, uh, as the main economic advisors to the Pinochet regime in the early 1970s? This is an image of uh, some soldiers right after the, the, the 73 coup, uh, burning some books, as a matter of fact. So again, this is, this is meant to, to illustrate uh, the very peculiar nation of the conditions that were prevailing at the time. And I think this is an important part of the story that I'm trying to tell. That, that scene, that situation was really, really dramatic, really radical. Uh, and, and I think that's one of, the, one, one of the possible explanations for, again, the outcomes that we see emerging from this project. Uh, so for one thing, it's important to keep in mind that uh, the, the Chicago uh, Catholic University of Chile agreement, even though it was institutionally successful in the sense that it was put into place and a lot of Chileans were immediately sent to, to the US and they got their training and they came back and they had their jobs as professors at the Catholic University of Chile. This did not mean that these people managed to get an important public position in Chilean society at the time. Quite the contrary, quite the contrary. Uh, throughout uh, the late 1960s and most of the 1960s, it was still ECLA economics, ECLA structuralism that, uh, that, that uh, dictated the terms of economic discourse and of economic argument in Chile and in most of Latin America for that, for that uh, regard. Uh, we talked about this, uh, of course, in the, in the previous lecture. And, and throughout most of this period, the Catholic University of Chile, it remained, especially the economics department of the Catholic University of Chile, it remained a very small and a very isolated enclave within that context. They were isolated even within the university itself, because during most of the 1960s, they were at odds with the rector of the university, with the president of the university, who really did not uh, 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 show much affection for the kind of ideological approach to economic uh, uh, organization to economic uh, uh, policy that they that they had started developing already by then uh, as a result of their training in, in in Chicago so for most of this time these this is really a group of economists who are working in isolation from Chilean society they have no political influence they have very little uh, uh, public outlets on which to speak and so they are basically doing academic work they're training other people and they're writing papers and they're cultivating the the, the academic connections that they had developed with their uh, professors and their mentors at Chicago. So this is this is the case for most of the 1960s, which, which is uh, basically, of course, uh, the 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 main period through which uh, during which the agreement was implemented. But there is one uh, important aspect of the way this agreement was was put into practice, and this also singles out the nature of this experience when you compare it with other types of, uh, of, of similar agreements, you know, of academic agreements that were signed at the time, uh, is that when these economists, these Chilean economists went to Chicago to study there, they found an unusually cozy environment for their work. Uh, again, this has to do, of course, with what I discussed in the previous slide, the fact that Chicago was in a fragile position. And so Chicago took the agreement very seriously at the time. They saw the agreement as an important institutional capital for the economics department, for this process of reconstruction of the economics department. And here, the, 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 the name of Ar Arnold Harberger, a professor at Chicago at the Times, and who was certainly the most well-connected of the Chicago scholars with the Chilean environment. He was even married to a, to a Chilean uh, woman. Uh, so Harberger is certainly the, the crucial link in this story because it was Harberger who took care of the Chileans who went to Chicago. He took them under, under his wing and managed to create a space where they could not only develop their uh, scientific uh, studies and their, their academic studies and their scientific research 
adequately, but they also managed to develop very strong professional, but also personal links amongst themselves, among the Chileans who were at Chicago, who were uh, 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 living in that environment, but also between the Chileans and the Chicago professors who were most closely uh, involved with the project. So again, this is very unique in the sense that you don't see very often in these uh, examples of agreements from that time, uh, the creation of such strong bonds between both the, 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 the people who participated in the, in the interchange, but also between these people and the, their sponsors at the, at the home institution. So this again is very, very, very singular, very unique of the, of the Chicago uh, Catholic uh, University of Chile agreement. I told you in the previous slide that uh, the the agreement was actually was originally brokered by ICA as part of the of the point four initiatives during the Eisenhower administration. Uh, as time went on, of course, uh, ICA and the the U.S. Uh, uh, foreign policy establishment in general started to withdraw from the process, uh, uh, and and so there was some slack to be picked up. You know, the continuity of the process depending on securing resources from other funds. Uh, and so here, that network of, of patronage for the social sciences that we discussed uh, yesterday in the first lecture uh, comes into place very strongly because it was the Ford Foundation who, 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 who emerged on the scene and said, well, okay, so we're, we're going to uh, uh, take this program into our hands, into our fold, and we're going to make sure that you have the necessary resources to, to continue doing this, this, uh, this initiative that so far has produced good results. I mean, we see the results. We see the Chileans who went to Chicago and came back and here a professor. So everything is working. There's no reason why we would discontinue this program. So we, we want to help you. So Ford uh, comes up on the scene uh, in, the, in the early to mid 60s uh, and starts to sponsor very heavily the, 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 the agreement itself. Uh, but what's important to note here is that this uh, was only one of really an enormous amount of similar projects that Ford was pursuing at the same time in Latin America. And here, uh, the changing foreign policy environment was, of course, a very important uh, uh, aspect of the story. Uh, we didn't talk about this yesterday, perhaps I should have mentioned, but I think uh, now, now is a good time to, 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 to connect these dots a little bit. Uh, after 1959 and after the Cuban Revolution of 1959, we see another inflection in the foreign policy agenda of the United States. If during the Eisenhower administration, the focus was basically on Asia, on Southeast Asia, on Korea, uh, so that, that was really the, 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 the main area of concern for foreign policy at the time. Uh, after the Cuban Revolution, there is a renewed sense of urgency about foreign policy towards Latin America. So the risk of another uh, communist insurgency that could be successful and take control of yet another Latin American, Latin American country, of course, was a prospect that the U.S. was not really uh, uh, interested in entertaining. Uh, and so uh, from, the 19, from the late 1950s, and especially from the early 1960s onwards, and this, of course, uh, coincides with the ascension of Kennedy to the presidency, the, the development of the Alliance for, Pro, uh, for Progress uh, initiative and all that, uh, there is, again, a refocusing of attention towards Latin America and Ford Foundation and the Ford Foundation embarks on that on that uh, wave as well. So up until then, Ford had been very absent from Latin America. So it's very little initiatives that, are, that have been pursued by Ford in Latin America. But from 1959 onwards, Ford really goes uh, all the way in Latin America. So it starts to channeling a really humongous amount of resources towards uh, the um, uh, development or the implementation of certain uh, programs in Latin America, and especially programs geared to uh, geared sorry towards the social sciences. So, in a first moment in the early '60s, economics comes up big. Economics and public public administration, in fact, are the main uh, beneficiary areas. So, there are really a, a enormous amount of of graduate programs in economics that were created throughout the entire continent that were sponsored originally, originally by Ford in the early 1960s. Uh, and this continues throughout the, the entire decade as we will see uh, later on. So again, uh, for Ford at that time, picking up the Chicago Catholic uh, University of Chile agreement did not really mean much 
They were just, you know, engaging in yet another initiative of the same kind that they had been pursuing and developing uh, in many other places, including in Chile itself. And this is an important uh, aspect of the story as well. Uh, at the same time that Chicago, that Ford uh, was sponsoring the Chicago Catholic University of Chile agreement, they also started developing a, pro a program with Escolatina, which was the graduate program at the University of Chile. And that program was very, very strongly geared towards ECLA structuralism. So from the point of view of Ford at that time, they're basically trying to, to support everything. They're trying to diversify their portfolio. So they want to give a little bit to these guys who are Chicago free market economists, but they also want to give a little bit to these guys who are ECLA structuralists. You know? So we want to have a plural, what they first seen. We want to have people working on different subjects, on different topics, from different perspectives. So that's more or less the logic of the Ford Foundation's uh, uh, investment decisions uh, in, that, in Latin America at that time. Uh, of course, uh, as time went, uh, goes on and as the, the political uh, conditions in the whole continent start to deteriorate very, very, very rapidly towards the late 1960s, we'll talk about this process uh, as it concerns Brazil in a moment, uh, the attitudes of the Ford Foundation start to change as well. I'll talk about this when I discuss the Brazilian case uh, in, more, in more detail. Uh, but it's important to note from the start that when the, 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 the military coup arrives in 1970, the Ford Foundation is very is very uh, prompt in its response, and it's very is very uh, uh, how can I say what's what's the appropriate word? It's very I want, I don't want to say radical, but they react very strongly to the situation. And they say, well, we cannot condone this kind of regime. So they act very quickly to, on one hand, withdraw their program officers from Chile and closed the Santiago office who had been active for, for already a long time. Uh, so that's uh, an important symbolic action that the foundation uh, takes at the time. And uh, at the same time, they start to develop these programs to assist in the relocation of the persecuted scholars from Chile. So either creating these uh, independent think tanks, independent research uh, uh, institutes that could somehow uh, uh, host these scholars or else sending these scholars uh, elsewhere to other countries, both in Latin America and elsewhere in Europe and the United States and helping them uh, reestablish themselves professionally. So again, uh, when the military coup arrives, the Ford Foundation takes a very clear and very strong position against that political development and basically uh, 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 terminates for the time being at least all its involvement with the funding of, uh, of uh, intellectual activities basically in Chile. But of course, by that time, the work that had been developed since 1955, 1956 was already very well established. You know, so again, the Ford Foundation can take that action and, 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 and withdraw from the scene, uh, but the results of the work that had been developed were still there. And it was precisely those resources that had been produced by one part, one sector, one segment of the initiatives that had been sponsored by Ford uh, from the 1960s, at least in Chile, uh, would result, of course, in what we today we, we, we know very, very widely as the Chicago Boys phenomenon. So again, a very peculiar story, a story full of details, full of nuances, uh, but that eventually leads to this uh, very well-known uh, result. Now, if we look at Brazil, uh, we see on one hand, and this is a this is a picture that you see on the slide from a meeting, a sort of a a, 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 a show meeting uh, of the Institute of Brazilian Studies that had been created at Vanderbilt University, a university in, in the state of, of Tennessee in Nashville, uh, in, the, in the in the southern United States, uh, in the late 1940s. So the person you see here. Uh, where I'm pointing is Reynold Carlson, who was the economist that had been hired to work at this, institu this Institute of Brazilian uh, Studies. That was actually the first area studies program. Remember, we talked about this yesterday, about the, 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 the dissemination of these area studies programs during the 50s and 60s. This was the first area studies, programs, uh, area studies program created in the United States uh, spe specifically to study Brazil or to, 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 uh, uh, to dedicate itself to Brazil. Brazilian scholarship. Uh, so again, this is a very pioneering initiative. Uh, 
uh, and explains a little bit the origins of, of the story that I'm going to tell you uh, throughout the, the course of the next couple of slides. Uh, but again, you'll see, and this is what I'll try to show, how even though there are some very important similarities between the Brazilian case on one hand and the Chilean case on the other, there are also some telling differences uh, that, will, that will lead uh, in the end to very different outcomes. So uh, the, the agreement in question here is agreement that was signed by Vanderbilt University, the university that I just described to you, and the University of Sao Paulo uh, already in the 1960s. So it was a, a little bit of a protracted negotiation process. It started in 1964, but it was only concluded in 1966. The Ford Foundation, in fact, had already made uh, 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 an initial donation towards that agreement in 1964, but the formal agreement involving US, USAID was only finalized in 1966. So USAID, of course, was the agency that was created uh, uh, in the early 19, 1960s to implement the Alliance for Progress. So it substituted ICA. It was the substitute of, of ICA uh, within this new context and, of course, uh, operating within a, a, a foreign policy environment that was much more progressive politically because it was part of, of, of the, of the uh, Kennedy uh, political campaign, uh, but also that was much strongly influenced by what we talked about yesterday, the presence of Kennedy's action intellectuals. So all these social scientists that were very enthralled by modernization theory during the late 50s and early 60s, these were the people who were behind uh, the conception of, of this program and who helped, of course, design the institution, the institution of structure of agencies like USAID, which still exists uh, to, uh, until today, by the way. But there is already one important difference between the Brazilian case and the, and the Chilean case in the fact that when the agreement was signed in 1966, Brazil was already governed by a military regime. So Brazil had been uh, 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 the victim of a military, a military coup in 1964, in the early 1964. Uh, and so since then, uh, the country had been governed by a, by a military uh, uh, regime, and it was going to remain under military rule until the mid-1980s. So the context for the implementation, for the initial implementation of the agreement was already very different, whereas the... Um, uh, Chilean agreement was implemented in a country that was uh, fully democratic. In Brazil, the, the, the agreement was already negotiated and implemented in an authoritarian, uh, non-democratic context. So, of course, that uh, put a series of, of different variables on the table uh, that, uh, that, that, that were important, as we'll see later on. Uh, but in its spirit, it wasn't that much different. Of course, it was, it was much less, uh, we could say, ideologically geared towards the defense of free market economics. Uh, I think it's fair to say that, uh, but it was uh, portrayed uh, as uh, an explicit effort at modernization. So it was sold, it was, it, was, it, was, it was designed and sold as a modernization program. And it was sold as a modernization program on several different levels. It was sold as a modernization program in economics itself. You know, so the idea that the state of economics education in Brazil was too poor, too precarious. You know, so the economists that were trained and formed by Brazilian universities, they did not really qualify as economists according to the, to the prevailing standards of the profession in the Northern Hemisphere. And so it was necessary to institute higher standards of training, uh, standards of training more attuned to the, 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 the current uh, um, frontier of knowledge in economic science. So there's that aspect of modernization, modernization of education itself. But it was also sold as a modernization program in the sense that it would be responsible for training the public officials, the government officials, the technicians that would be responsible and capable of implementing the reforms that the Brazilian military regime wanted to put into practice. Uh, so differently from uh, the, the, Ch the later Chilean military regime, the Brazilian military regime actually mixed elements of conservatism with progressivism. So for instance, the military were very strongly in favor of industrialization, of the continuing process of industrialization of Brazil, uh, of investment in infrastructure, in industrial infrastructure, and in capital goods industries, for instance. This, this was going to be a common theme during the 1970s, for instance. Uh, 
Uh, and they were also very enamored with uh, the techniques of economic planning and programming. So the, the administrative apparatus that was put in place by the military government was an apparatus that, an apparatus that was very strongly geared towards uh, uh, planning efforts. You know, and because of that, of course, they demanded, they expected to have uh, personnel, to have technicians that would be able to carry through on that, on that uh, idea, on that design, and that would be able to to function effectively as as uh, as uh, technocrats, as, as as planners that would be that would lead the process of development and modernization of, of the country. Just as uh, Theodore Schultz was a crucial figure uh, in the brokering of the Chicago Catholic University of Chile agreement, Reynold Carlson was the crucial figure for brokering the Vanderbilt São Paulo agreement because. Uh, Carlson, as we, as we, as I, I told you a moment ago, as we see in the picture, he was a professor at Vanderbilt University during the early 1950s, uh, when the Institute for Brazilian Studies were first uh, was first created. Uh, and even though he left the university to work on uh, on um, uh, on other uh, organs such as the World Bank, for instance, during the late 19, 1950s. He remained very strongly attached to the university and eventually came back as a professor at different times during the 60s and the 70s. So he had a very strong connection uh, with Vanderbilt University. But Carlson was also a specialist in Brazilian economics. He had been a part, for instance, of one of the early uh, technical aid missions that had been set up under Truman's Point Four program, which was the mixed Brazil-United States uh, Commission that was functioning between 1951 and 1953. So Carlson was 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 a part was an important part of that team of U.S. Uh, experts that were sent to Brazil uh, to. Um, to uh, to assist on the process of the de de designing a, a developmental plan, uh, he later uh, started developing very strong links with the Ford Foundation. He was actually the first uh, the first president, the first head of the Rio de Janeiro office uh, uh, that Ford created in the early 1960s. So he was very uh, very uh, strongly involved with the early steps of the Ford program in Latin America in general, but in Brazil in particular. And from that position, he was able to broker the agreement and sort of bring this, uh, this uh, very lucrative, uh, actually, contract to Vanderbilt University. Vanderbilt, who was, uh, as we will see in a moment, a very small and, and not very, very prominent academic uh, 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 institution in the US, especially in the field of economics at the time. Uh, contrary to the Catholic University of Chile, the University of Sao Paulo was a very large and very prestigious institution within Brazilian academia, academia who already had a very, a very uh, well-established corpus of prominent scholars. Uh, so here the contrast is very strong. You know, in the case of Chile, you have basically uh, an institution, a small institution that is willing to basically take on any terms uh, in order to use this opportunity to boost its own public profile. Whereas on the other hand, in Brazil, we have a large and prominent institution who, of course, will be much more selective in terms of what it wants to do and what it does not want to do. So, of course, the team of Vanderbilt uh, uh, economists and Vanderbilt scholars in general who were sent to work uh, with the Sao Paulo team, uh, they uh, they had much more difficulties imposing their own uh, their own view, their own approach uh, over the Sao Paulo uh, environment, because of course the university already had all this infrastructure and all this inertial uh, uh, machinery that was that, that was in place and that that basically you know geared it to to a certain direction. And Vanderbilt University, as I said a, a, a moment ago, was. Contrary to Chicago, Chicago, of course, I told you that Chicago was, was facing a, diffi a difficult moment at the time, but of course, the University of Chicago is and was at the time a very important institution in United States academia. So it was going through a, a rough moment, a difficult moment, but it still, of course, had a lot of, uh, of, of, of institutional cachet, of academic cachet that it could use uh, uh, in, in such a context. Whereas Vanderbilt, on the contrary, was a very small university from a uh, 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 a relatively poor and underdeveloped area of the country itself, the southern United States, Tennessee. Uh, and in economics, it had next to zero tradition. So it was basically a new program that had been put in place throughout the 1950s. Uh, and so, of course, the, the bargaining power of Vanderbilt vis-a-vis -a, -vis a university like Chicago was very, very limited. Uh, 
just an anecdote in some of the documents uh, in which the, the Vanderbilt people involved with the Sao Paulo agreements uh, discuss their experiences. Uh, they very often uh, mention how Brazilian students, when they were offered the opportunity of study for a PhD degree in Vanderbilt, they basically didn't really want to do that, you know, because they 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 looked at Vanderbilt as 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 a as a, a, a really a non-important institution. So they wanted to go to Stanford, they wanted to go to Harvard, to MIT, to Chicago, but they did not want to go to Vanderbilt. So that already gives you an idea of how this bargaining between the two institutions was very different than the one we saw a moment ago uh, in the case of of Chile. But Vanderbilt had a very different asset in its favor uh, insofar as this kind of initiative uh, was, was concerned that, that, that distinguished it from Chicago very, very clearly, which is the fact that Vanderbilt already by the mid 1950s, that is 10 years before uh, the agreement was signed, uh, had implemented a graduate program in economic development, again, with the support initially of ICA and later of the Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation as well. So again, remember that yesterday when I talked about the institutionalization of development economics, I mentioned the, 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 the research institutes that were created during the 50s and 60s, 60s that were specialized in economic development. Vanderbilt was one of them. So since 1956, Vanderbilt had a graduate program in economic development that exists again until today. It's still there. It's still a functioning program. And more than that, uh, as, a, as a consequence, as a derivation of the original Institute of Brazilian Studies, Vanderbilt also had a center for Latin American studies that had been functional since the, 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 the early 1960s. So they had that two-pronged attack. You know, they had expertise in economic development and development economics, we could say, on one hand, and they had expertise in area studies uh, regarding Latin America. So in that regard, they were much more well positioned to present themselves as people who had a, a type of knowledge to offer that was specifically adequate and specifically useful to the purpose at hand. And in that respect, again, Chicago and Vanderbilt are very different. You see, for instance, the documents, uh, some documents, some, some, some uh, recollections from the 70s and 80s by Arnold Harberger, for instance, reflecting on the experience of, 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 of the Chicago Catholic University of Chile agreement. And Harberger basically saying, well, in Chicago, the area orientation never was an important thing. You know, it was always the disciplinary orientation. We were training economists. We were not training specialists in Latin America or specialists in Chile. And in this respect, it's a very different uh, product, so to speak, that Vanderbilt is offering. So Vanderbilt is offering to train specialists in development economics with the working knowledge of Latin America. So in that regard, again, it's a very different product. Uh, but as in the case of Chile, uh, the, 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 the environment in which this agreement was implemented in Brazil also started to change very dramatically throughout the 1960s. Uh, one important uh, event in this respect was the promulgation in late 1968, in December 1968, of the infamous Institutional Act Number no. 5, which was uh, a government decree that basically increased the repressive powers of the military government and which kick-started a whole process of uh, intellectual purges in the universities, uh, uh, political uh, arrests, torture, uh, exile. So it really gave a much more repressive uh, uh, character to the Brazilian military regime that so far had been regarded as actually a kind of a moderate and enlightened regime. Of course, there were some, some tensions and some repression uh, in the early moments of the, of the, of the coup in 1964. Uh, but after that, the perception both domestically and by external observers like the Ford Foundation, for instance, was that the, compared to other similar situations worldwide, the Brazilian regime was actually a very moderate regime. But that changes very significantly, very clearly towards the late 1960s with the, uh, the implementation of these measures and, and the putting into practice practice of these repressive measures uh, that were a, a very a very marked characteristic of Brazilian, Brazilian history at that time. Uh, there were also developments in the US domestic scene that were starting to take its toll on the work of philanthropic foundations like Ford, for instance. And here we have another very symbolic episode, perhaps some of you 
have already heard of it, uh, which is the, the, the Project Camelot debacle in the mid 1960s. So Project Camelot was, uh, was a social science research project that was, that was devised uh, in, in the US uh, in the early to mid 1960s, and which had uh, financial backing by the CIA. So it was part again of that military uh, scientific uh, patronage uh, connection that we discussed yesterday in the first lecture. Uh, but this project that was funded somehow in secret, as, for instance, MIT Senate had been, and we talked about this yesterday and today already, uh, it, it was exposed in 1965, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, by one of its own participants, a person who had been uh, invited to be a part of the research team and who was well connected uh, with the, the Chilean scholarly community. So this person went to Chile on a work mission and he started talking about Chilean people about this, this, this project, uh, whose object was to basically understand uh, the social dynamics behind insurgency movements. And so that was the object of studies. So we're going we're gonna to understand what are the social movements, the social changes, the social tensions that eventually lead to insurgency movements and how do these insurgency, movement, these insurgency movements gather strength and eventually uh, manage to, uh, to succeed. So that was the objective and of course the purpose of that and that's why the project was financed by the CAA was to serve as an effective counterinsurgency weapon. So if we can understand, if we can predict when an insurgency situation is coming about, we can then interfere and try to change the course of things and so avoid that insurgency situation. So it was very explicitly uh, sold to the, to the donors, to the sponsors as a counterinsurgency tool. And so this Chilean guy, this scholar who uh, was a German scholar, actually, who, who was, had been invited to participate. And so he goes to Chile and he starts talking to people about this. And people say, well, we don't know anything about that. And so he starts noticing that there's something wrong with that project in the sense that it was not really a public and, and, and clearly aired uh, uh, project design. And so he blows the whistle. He gives interviews to, to Chile, first to Chilean newspapers and later to uh, uh, United States newspapers, basically explaining uh, how the scheme was set up. And that becomes uh, uh, an enormous polemic, an enormous controversy that, again, puts the focus very clearly on this connection between the military establishment on one hand and the social science research as it was done in, in the United States uh, at the time. Uh, and of course, this, this uh, has very strong repercussion, repercussions in Latin America itself because it creates this climate of suspicion uh, towards Yankee imperialism. You know, it's something that, of course, existed from earlier on, at least from the, the early 20th century. Uh, but it was something that throughout the post-war era, uh, the post-war era with these changing uh, uh, foreign policy initiatives, Truman's Point Four program, Kennedy's Alliance for Progress, there was a lot of goodwill that had been rebuilt in these uh, diplomatic relations between U.S. and Latin America. But of course, uh, the episode, uh, the Camelot episode and other similar episodes that came to light shortly thereafter, uh, for instance, the, the CA funding to the culture, the, the Congress for Cultural uh, Freedom is another very, very uh, well-known example from that time, uh, rekindles that anti-imperialist spirit and say, well, basically all of these social scientists that are coming here as, you know, neutral, apolitical experts that, will, that are going to help us solve our problems, they're actually just infiltrated agents. And of course, that uh, makes it more, much more difficult for agencies such as Ford, who are involved in sponsoring these cooperation agreements with the social sciences in Latin America, to, to do their work. So again, the, the, the environment is changing in, in, many, in many different ways. Uh, within uh, the United States uh, political scene, of course, the rise of the civil rights movement and, uh, and the pacifist movements against the war in Vietnam, of course, also change the climate of public opinion and, and make uh, these uh, agencies such as Ford, which, as we discussed yesterday, always strive to somehow keep at least an image of independence in the sense that they did not simply follow the lead of the foreign policy establishment of the official political channels, 
but they actually had their own agenda and their own goals and their own criteria and basically uh, were autonomous to design and implement their own projects. So this change in the climate of opinion actually induces a lot of rethinking, a lot of soul searching within the Ford Foundation itself. So the extension of Mac George Bundy as president of the foundation in 67, if I'm not mistaken, uh, is, a, is, is, a, is a watershed moment in that sense because he introduces uh, a whole set of new concerns within the fold of the foundation. So if before that, the focus was on uh, technical development system and capital accumulation and infrastructure and all that and agriculture, uh, after McGeorge Bundy becomes president, you see the rise of topics like civil rights, like human rights, uh, like uh, uh, minorities. So all these new uh, political issues that are coming up in the domestic political scene are also starting to influence the the work that the Ford Foundation is developing both inside the U.S. but also outside of the U.S. Of course, very, very hard to, to disentangle the two things. Uh, in the case of Brazil, these two things converge, you know, these two tendencies in the U.S. and in Latin America converge when the foundation is discussing the prospect of a grant to the University of Brasilia, to the creation of a new social sciences program in the University of Brasilia. Uh, this, this grant and this, the, the discussions around this grant are important because Brasilia was a very peculiar institution at that moment. Now, Brasilia, I don't, probably most of you do not know, Brasilia, the current capital of Brazil, was actually uh, a planned city that was constructed in the, in, the, in the 50s and inaugurated in the late 1950s. So it was a brand new city uh, that would serve as the seat of the federal government. Uh, and as part of the original project behind the, 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 the city, there was the creation of a university that would be, uh, of course, the, the, the local big university. Uh, but the University of Brasilia, after the, uh, the military coup in 1964, was certainly the most affected academic institution in Brazil because it was subject, and this, of course, has to do with the fact that it was so close to the seat of the federal government. Uh, it was subject to three episodes of military intervention. And the picture that you see in the slide is actually uh, 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 taken in, uh, from one of these episodes in 1965, uh, if I'm not mistaken, when police invaded the campus and arrested professors, arrested uh, students. And so this led to uh, massive resignations from the, from the faculty and a complete restructuring of the university. And so the University of Brasilia at that time, in the late 60s, was a very explosive uh, uh, political environment. And so when Ford starts discussing the possibility of, uh, of actually financing the development of social sciences in Brasilia, the university that had been uh, subject to inter repeated interventions to resignations to, to purges and, 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 and the like, uh, this raises a lot of moral and ethical red flags. You know? So there's a lot, again, of soul searching while this uh, grant uh, is being discussed in 69, 70, 71 in particular, before uh, the, the, uh, the, the foundation finally decides to, to, to go ahead and give uh, the social sciences in scientists in Brasilia the, uh, the, the money. But one result that emerged, and this is sort of the end of the story, uh, the, the one result, result that emerges from this discussion is that uh, that that trauma, you know, of having to deal with that very morally complicated situation uh, uh, in, in within uh, an increasingly repressive and authoritarian military regime uh, actually uh, made the 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 the, the far foundation staff the four foundation staff, sorry, who worked in Latin America, much more sensitive to issues of tolerance, of pluralism, of diversity. And so this sort of becomes the touchstone that will guide the future development of the Ford Foundation program for economics, but for the, the social sciences in general throughout the 1970s. And this has very strong implications because it was during that time precisely that the structure of uh, the Brazilian economics community was, uh, was, was, was settled. Uh, and it was settled according to these pluralist uh, uh, benchmarks. And this remains so to this day. So in Brazil today, we have uh, an academic environment in economics that is much more plural and much more diverse, that has space for different theoretical traditions than we find uh, in most other places uh, in the world. And that, uh, at least in my interpretation, is, is a very, very clear result of some of the choices that were made by Ford uh, at, the, at the time, and of course, by the Brazilian economists who were working uh, with Ford in these uh, agreements. Yeah. <laughs>
So to conclude, and this is the, the very last slide of all, uh, what do I want to show you with this contrast between these two uh, cases of you know, development actions, development programs that were geared to the modernization of Latin American societies around the same time? On one hand, uh, if we look at it from a distance, you really see a lot of commonalities. You know, you look at the Brazilian case, you look at the Chilean case, there's, there's really a lot of common ground between these two cases. You know, both of them have ha had to do with uh, foreign policy stra strategies within a Cold War context. Both of them were motivated explicitly by modernization concerns and were framed more or less within the language of modernization theory. Uh, both of them had to do with the creation of national communities of economists, you know, of, 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 of local specialists who could uh, provide economic knowledge. Both of them, of course, had to do involve the Latin American nations. Both of them had to do with the nations that at some point during that period, you know, during the, 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 this, the, the, these two episodes were governed by authoritarian governments. And both of them involved the work of philanthropic foundations from the United States, and in particular, one philanthropic foundation, the Ford Foundation, uh, uh, at the service of these uh, developmental uh, assistance programs. So we look from afar and we see really a lot of similarities, a lot of common work, you, you, a lot of common ground. You can see that uh, as two episodes of the same process, you know, two instances of the same of the same pattern, you could say. But if we look closely, we start to see the difference. Uh, we see different political rhythms in both countries, you know, the ascension of the military dictatorships, the way that these military dictatorships uh, worked, the way that they progressed, the way that they became harsher or softer with time, uh, the way that uh, the political uh, uh, issues at stake in the United States itself also evolved during that period and introduced new, new uh, relevant items. Uh, we have, of course, different institutional actors involved, Chicago and the Catholic University of Chile in the, in the Chilean case, Vanderbilt and the University of Sao Paulo and other Brazilian universities in the Brazilian case. So different institutional actors who were positioned differently, who had different motivations. And of course, we have different social contexts, you know, the space, the, 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 the environment in which these, uh, these initiatives were developed and pursued, uh, uh, deferred both between the two countries and through time as the conditions in these two countries evolved. And because of those differences, we actually see very different results emerging at the end. You know, in one case, we see, again, the origins of neoliberalism, the first neoliberal experiment with the ascension of the Chicago boys uh, to the position of, uh, of economic czars during the military government. And in the Brazilian case, a very diverse and plural economic environment that values tolerance and that positions, you know, this diversity and pluralism as, as an intellectual value to be cherished and, 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 uh, and preserved. And so this is my last uh, point to conclude. I see that Dennis is already a little impatient with me again going over time, but this is the very last point. Uh, I think we can look at these different experiences that again, look similar from afar to look very different once you get closer to them as both a parable and a cautionary tale that is relevant to the history of development economics in general. Uh, it is a parable in the sense that it, that, it, that, it, that it illustrates very clearly some of the dilemmas that were involved with development economics from the very start. You know, this idea that we can look at underdevelopment and somehow understand that as a problem, as a sort of a unified problem that can be diagnosed and can be uh, remedied, can be solved with the use of certain techniques, of certain, uh, certain policies, of certain uh, measures. And so this tendency to always somehow uh, synthesize a whole corpus of different historical experiences into a few catchphrases, a few catchwords. And that's obviously one of the difficulties that the early pioneers of development economics faced as they tried to put their ideas uh, into practice. But it is also, also a cautionary tale because it reminds us, and this is what the, photo that you, the photos that you see on the side of the slide are meant to, to, uh, to convey. Uh, you see uh, in the bottom photo, of course, is a photo of Esther Duflo in one of the poverty labs, uh, recent uh, initiatives uh, in Africa. And here, of course, you have a Rockefeller uh, Foundation initiative initiative in, in agriculture in Kenya in the 1950s. And of course, Esther Duflo is dressed in a much less formal attire than the experts in the, the above photo. 
but you can see how the situation seems remarkably similar in some respects. You know, you see you see this foreign expert that is very clearly out of his element where he is. He's trying to fit in, but it's hard to fit in, you know, because it's so clearly different from everything else around him or her. And so again, when we see uh, uh, more recent instances of development economics uh, being portrayed and being sold as the magic pills that will solve all our problems, all the problems of poverty and underdevelopment once and for all, it's, it's good to keep in mind uh, how little things, little differences here and there in different contexts can produce really very different results. That was it. Thank you very much. <laughs>